I've been here a while. I'm trying to think of reasons not to do this. It's Kill or Be Killed in Blue Ruin, the 2013 action revenge thriller from director Jeremy Saulnier. This is a movie that concerns itself very much with the cliches of its genre and that it makes a point of avoiding them. But what makes this anti-revenge revenge film outstanding isn't just that it frustrates and opposes virtually every trope of the standard revenge action thriller, but because its unusual approach is also a realistic one. There's a strange mix of artifice and verisimilitude as a classic tragedy plays out in a real-world setting, among people who might be your neighbors. Aside from the preponderance of blue, the visuals and performances are naturalistic, which has the immediate effect of inviting the audience to take the events of the story seriously. It's clear right away that this won't be your usual exciting action flick. There are no action stars or villainous ciphers here. The characters feel real, and the world they inhabit is our own. It's my house, Dwight. I know that. The car is registered here, and it's not worth... Is there a gun in the house? Of course not. We meet Dwight as the movie opens, at a point where he's already been consumed by loss. Self-ostracized and neglected, he lives out of his car. Both of them models of melancholy, each of them a blue ruin. He's going to be released. And I don't know how much you... He learns that Wade Cleland, the man in prison for the murder of Dwight's parents, is to be released on parole. This impels Dwight to action when it seems that nothing else could. Desire for revenge provides the focus he needs to get his car and himself back into gear. He intercepts the Clelands on their way home from the penitentiary and lays wait in the men's room of a bar, armed with a knife. His plan is as shabby as the surroundings. Everything could go wrong. There is no cleverness in his plan and his execution is anything but smooth. There's only a brief opportunity and the fallout of rash decisions. <laughs> Having the incredible good fortune both of finding Wade alone and managing to escape after killing him, Dwight discovers a passenger in the back of the limo. William, a young member of the Cleland clan, asks him if he hurt Wade. Yeah. Wade hurt my parents. I don't think he did. This is the first suggestion in the film that Wade may not be guilty of the murder of Dwight's parents. It's obvious that Dwight had never considered this possibility. Moreover, William demonstrates a concern for Wade that Dwight also had not considered. A man has a family, people who will miss him, people who will grieve for his loss and look to assign blame. The audience comes to realize, as Dwight does, that the violence he set in motion has not concluded with the murder of Wade, but rather he has perpetuated a cycle that will continue for the remainder of the story. The Where are your children? Home. The sitter. Let's get back in your car. They never called the police. Anticipating the Cleland's counterattack at the home of his sister, Dwight manages an ambush and is able to escape with an arrow in his leg and a prisoner in his car trunk.
Confronting Teddy, his prisoner, Dwight learns that in fact it was Wade Sr. who murdered Dwight's parents, but that his son confessed in order to protect his father. The old man died a free man. You just meant Wade didn't kill your parents. That's not true. That settles it then. That's how this works, man. The one with the gun gets to tell the truth. This is a crucial moment as Dwight learns the very justification for his revenge had ceased to exist before the events of the film even began. When Dwight killed Wade, he was already bereft of purpose, living only to avenge his parents' death. Upon learning that Wade wasn't the killer, Dwight is truly empty. He accepts his own destruction, declaring himself deserving of no better. I'll die. I should. But my sister never did anything to you, so if you please just tell me. Bet. I got the gun. You get the truth. The futility of the cycle of violence that he has set in motion is absolute. Hey. Hey, man. I know this is personal. That's how you'll fail. No speeches. No talking. You point the gun. You shoot the gun. But nature abides, and as long as a man draws breath, there's always something or someone he is willing to kill to protect. Hey, were you coming for me or for her? Were you coming for me or for her? Approaching the Cleveland compound, it's worth noting that Dwight leaves his keys when concealing his car. He has no expectation of leaving the property. He knows that what's to come will consume whatever is left of him, and simply hopes it will also sufficiently reduce the Clelands so his sister need fear no reprisal. The Clelands, of course, have guns. And more guns. And still more guns. For protection, no doubt. You never know when some lunatic bent on taking your life might break into your home. There's a not-too-subtle suggestion here that the ready availability of firearms feeds into the inclination towards violence, and that those least to be trusted with their keeping are the ones most inclined to stockpile. Blue Ruin isn't just an anti-revenge revenge film, it's a decidedly anti-gun shoot 'em up But when he breaks into their home in search of enemies, Dwight discovers an empty house. There's nothing to confront except the mementos of a family history he plans to bring to an abrupt end, and his own conscience. The burial of Teddy is an act of contrition. Dwight accepts that the Clelands are a family like his own. Having viewed the photo album and seen the progression of the family history, he seems ready to accept that they are not some monolithic evil to be overcome, but victims like himself of a process that started long before their story began, and that may well continue after they are done killing one another. This won't be like his attack on Wade, when he had only a moment to consider before he struck. This time, his violence must be deliberate. He has time to think before acting, the adrenaline of impulse replaced by the grudging acceptance that the violence to come is inevitable. By the time the Clelands arrive home, Dwight has had nearly two days to think about what he's doing, and the weight of his guilt has filled him with doubt. I don't know how this ends, but I'd like it to. Um, or it can keep going. 
I just need my sister to be left out of this. That's why we're going to Pittsburgh, you dumb son of a bitch! <laughs> but when the time comes, the necessity of killing seems insurmountable, even if it means his own doom. I'd forgive you if you were crazy, but you're not. You're weak. Dwight isn't cool. He'll never be a hero. He's a victim and knows no solution except to victimize in turn. Dwight's is a tragic and wasted life. And in the end, it isn't he who is saved, or even particularly his sister's family. It's William Cleland, born of both families, who turns his back on the violence and discards his gun. The key act at the climax of a revenge thriller is the image of a boy who walks away. Blue Ruin manages to be a classic tragedy with themes that are anything but subtle, and the clearly intentional inversions of genre tropes make it a fascinating project, but for me what really sells the film is a portrayal by actor Macon Blair of Dwight. Not the hero you expect, some everyman rising to the demands of a violent situation to avenge the fallen, but the ruination of a once loving and motivated human being, reduced by his grief and his weakness to acts of violence that his enemies might rightly see as excessive and depraved. It's an unusually honest portrayal. Because it's presented in earnest, through characters we can believe in, Blue Ruin is also an invitation to consider issues of revenge and forgiveness, of gun violence and its consequences. It's a movie that reminds us it's better to live quietly than to die in the imagined glory of violence. You know, it's awful. It's because my dad loved your mom. We all end up dead. The tragedy of Blue Ruin is that Dwight has lost before the story even started, one of many victims of a cycle of violence and the rampant accessibility of firearms. There was never any vindication possible, no real vengeance, no justice, no hope. In Blue Ruin, the ultimate tragedy is that the tragedy has already occurred, that Dwight exists in a state of defeat, and no outcome was ever possible but destruction. I, um, I just, um, yeah. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and watch our other videos. Leave any comments you may have, and if you have suggestions as to what movie you'd like to see reviewed next, please let me know.